I think there was a question over here. Um, thank you again for your work. I find this really fascinating. Um, so I have a question relating to this idea of consumer culture. You mentioned earlier and also in, the, in your presentation and also in your book um, that men have sort of leave home and they have picked up these sort of westernized ideas about baby and then of course they sort of use that to gauge the way that they're judging, you know, single partners, which of course drives the women to consume. Um, but I'm curious um, if you, in your work, you found that there were other avenues by which women were receiving this messaging, this messaging that's sort of westernized and drives to drives them to consume. Um, whether it may be the prevalence of the internet coming around or <laughs> magazines, advertisements. I'm just curious what you found to be some of the most um, the most driving forces behind that. So um, um, in the 50s and, and, and 60s and, 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 and certainly earlier, I think that one of the reasons of sort of men coming back into the community and sort of having new norms or different norms for, for you know what what beauty now comes to. But now um, a lot of the ways that girls sort of the images that girls encounter, the ones like I just showed you with Lupita Nyong'o, uh, or the billboards that they, they look at advertising, you know, different kinds of products. Uh, or um, you'd be surprised, like you know the soap operas, like. Uh, uh, the, the, the young and restless, uh, <laughs> both and the beautiful, I think there's one like that, right? So, so the American soap operas that people will find people watching um, are sort of another avenue, you know, for what I do, when I do. Oh yeah, the rich home surprise, the Latin American soap opera, right? And so that's another sort of, you know, things that girls will talk about, things that they'll, they'll see, that they'll, how the women are and how they're dressed. And then the magazines, so a lot of secondhand magazines, um, uh, 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 other ways in which uh, girls would, would see. And so there are very few increasingly westernized images of, of, of beauty um, that, that uh, or I should say, commodified, uh, expensive kinds of beauty that they're being exposed to. There are very few um, ways of doing beauty and femininity that don't involve consumption sometimes. That are, that are valued. Yeah, I think I remember growing up, they, 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 they were alternative images. Like you see women washing clothes, you know, who look very sort of straightforward, you know, uh, as well as women who are, who are made up. But increasingly, I think there are fewer of those images now. Um, uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and the internet. So the internet wasn't as uh, sort of big a feature at the time I was doing my field work, but I imagine that it is now. Oh, way back there, okay. <laughs> While she's going back there, could I uh, get my sign-in sheet back, please? Thank you. <laughs> Did everybody get a chance to sign it? For my class. I got over here. Okay, um, these are a lot of good questions. Seem like really vague and not as good, but um, your research is very thorough and you seem very passionate about what you do. And if you don't mind sharing, I want to know what drove you to start researching all this in the first place. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, uh, so, so I, I think that the initial idea that I was interested in health, so that put I began the presentation with. The idea that people don't get sick by accident was such a shock to me, right? Because, you know, gosh, this is flu season, right? <laughs> like, it's random, like, who gets a cough and who doesn't get a, get a cough and why? And, and so it's a, it's a much more compelling idea that it's random than the fact that it's socially patterned. And so the idea that you could actually predict who would get sick based on particular kinds of characteristics was really shocking to me. And so when I connected to the HIV AIDS epidemic, which was ravaging the continent. Um, my grandmother um, um, lived in Uganda, and she was describing going to a um, you know, funeral every week of someone she knew, and you know, going to a village or community and be, you know, going to the wrong funeral because there were so many. If you think about what these numbers look like in terms of deaths, because I mentioned earlier, you're going to a funeral every, every week. And so 
I um, did an internship um, between college and um, grad school where I interned with a, a woman who was um, HIV testing counselor. So what would happen, and this was when you had to wait um, you know, a couple of weeks for your results. Uh, <laughs> if you can imagine, you know, I was of that way, but you sort of, so, so people would come in for the test and they would have counseling before they did the test. And what would happen in the counseling is they would ask, you know, so what are you going to do if you're positive? What are you going to do if you're negative? And, and so with women, with, with children especially, who are the m most common people to come in, and partly due to, due to stigma uh, for men, uh, as, as well as women, but, but and men as well in terms of coming in, um, uh, you know, so sort of thinking of where your kid's going to go and where, you know, what are you going to do about, you know, and so essentially planning for what happens when you die because there's no medication. And then I realized that for each individual who's coming into this office that there are millions, you know, millions more, you know, 24 million people living with HIV AIDS. Uh, and so I wanted to really um, come up with a study that helped me think about why, you know, something that would help the millions of people living with HIV AIDS as opposed to just the really important work that the lady I interned with was doing, which I found really emotionally tough. Um, and so, so that's what took me to grad school, was I wanted to sort of figure out this HIV AIDS thing. <laughs> it took me many years to at least feel like I had something to say um, in, in, in this book. And then that paper that I showed you, um, that I came across in grad school, that showed that young women have much higher rates of HIV compared to young men. And I wanted to figure out why. Um, so, so that's what drove me um, into the field. And does that answer your question? I can't see you now. Oh yeah, does it answer? I think we can take a couple more questions. Um, I see a young uh, lady back there. Uh, concerning the modern woman, because that's suppose that modern woman understands the reasons and the causes of HIV AIDS compared to the woman that in the village is not educated. And the rate of the modern woman is so high compared to that. What's the reason behind that? What brings the modern woman get to be more infected than the village woman? Yeah, so that's, a, that's exactly the, the puzzle. It is why, why educated women are the ones with, with, with the high rates. And so part, part of what I was showing was there's a, there's a, a sort of a bind or a dilemma for a girl pursuing education. That going to school you want is essentially becoming a modern woman. Because it means the same thing, but becoming a modern woman involves uh, consumption. And if you can't afford to consume or to buy, then you, you, know, you have a relationship with someone who can provide, which puts you at risk. Right? And so girls are in this sort of double bind. And so sometimes a providing boyfriend would help with school fees. Right? And so it's, it's a kind of gamble. You're hoping you don't get like a, a quote I have at the top of the education chapter, a joke with a boy is a child with a disease, something like that, that a father would tell the school girl, you know, his daughter who was going to school, that you're gambling on not getting HIV and not getting pregnant and finishing high school. You know? and, and so this was the challenge uh, for, for a lot of young women. Um, uh, and, and I think, too, the, the, the girls in the village um, were, were also less likely to have needs, those sorts of needs. <laughs> so they didn't have to have money to buy them because they didn't have those needs. So once you have needs, you need money for those needs. <laughs> and that's part of the problem. Yeah. Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah, so she asked a question about wife inheritance. Um, and so wife inheritance, which is um, you know, sort of prevalent in a lot of uh, communities um, that are um, uh, in, in several parts of, of, of Africa in addition to this particular area that I study. So what it is is 
essentially the idea that when um, a husband dies, the wife is supposed to be inherited, right? So, so if you think of in you know, really base terms, it's not treated this way, but the idea that a wife belongs to a family, right? And so she's inherited to keep her, so this is how someone who believes in wife inheritance would explain it. Right, this is in order to keep her within the family and to enable her to stay in the family now. Right? And so oftentimes uh, a brother or male relative uh, of the husband would be the one to inherit the wife. And these relationships are often sexual relationships. One reason they were sexual was especially if the man died and the, the couple didn't have any children, this was a way to enable that man's lineage to carry on. So any children that a widow would have would be considered the child of her dead husband. Okay, so this was the practice of wife inheritance. Um, and so she's asking, you know, I didn't talk about it in the presentation, so I wrote a paper on wife inheritance um, uh, called Providing Women Kept Men, because I found a very unusual pattern of wife inheritance happening, where young men were having, you know, becoming the inheritors of widows. Right, so the puzzle there was why would a young man have a relationship with a potentially HIV infected woman, right, widow, older woman. Um, and and, and, and um, so there are a lot of widows in this setting, about one in five, it was shocking actually, one in five um, uh, uh, women, if I recall correctly, uh, were widows uh, in this setting. So a lot of widows. Um, and so if you sort of put on top of that this customer expectation that women are going to be inherited um, but families were stopped, started to not want inheritance because what happened devastatingly was brother after brother would die as HIV passed throughout the family. So over time, the practice within the family ended. Um, and what they started doing was um, hiring. So a whole industry emerged around inheritance, like the term. You know, so there were like the sort of young men. So this was a job. Right, where a family is actually paying to, 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 to inherit. Um, and so uh, I, I found some of these accounts in the context of, of, of my study, and I was sort of trying to investigate why these relationships were ongoing. Um, and so it seemed like um, young men would, um, there was an economy of widows, so men would move, you know, you know, you know would, would, would have relationships with rich widows who would now be responsible for providing. For them, right? So the relationship kind of reversed, and so they became essentially that. You know, I, I jokingly say this is my Kruger's Gigolo's paper, <laughs> right? But women were the ones who were providing for men, right? So what would men would do is they would have relationships with young women uh, on the side, and so they would use some of the money they accumulated in the context of these inheriting relationships uh, in order to have relationships with younger women. Um, and so it was a practice that was really controversial because. Women and widows felt a lot of pressure from the community to be inherited, um, and they really had to fight or resist um, the pressure to, to be inherited. And so sometimes in some communities I encountered, people wouldn't like help widows rebuild their houses if they refused to be inherited. Uh, and so a lot of non-governmental organizations I came across were helping widows to build their house uh, and helping them to manage uh, in the face of the, the, the pressure from the community to be inherited. Um, and so that definitely, definitely came up. I didn't include it in the book because it seemed a, sort of more about middle-aged women and um, about young women, um, but I did write about it in a, in a, in a separate paper, yeah. Oh, wow. you've been very generous with us. to have a little more to drink and eat back there. I also want to thank the sponsors of this event, which I apologize, I neglected to do at the beginning, which is when I really should have um, done this. 